we were chatting um, a little while ago and, uh, about the health and fitness industry and, and I was t telling you about a lot of the people that I've interviewed, whether they're trainers, training athletes, celebrities, people that are overweight. One of the things that always comes back in terms of how these diets or workouts are successful is that they have to start with working with you know the people's heads or brains whatever you want to call it you know they, they need to get them them mentally engaged into what they're doing because if they don't do that then, then no matter what else happens um they're not going to be successful and from when I was listening to a little bit about what you said, you know, people that have maybe had accidents or bumps or things that have happened maybe a long time in their life may cause their brain patterns to, to not be firing in exactly the correct way. They might not be like this cohesiveness that you spoke about, which can lead to people being, you know, depressed and not knowing about it or just having different kind of episodes. And, and, and I suppose that if, if you are going through some sort of irregularity in your brain that you may not necessarily know, then trying to focus on something, which you mentioned that I have, or, or, or change charts or do, or do all these sort of daily tasks, that may be sort of interrupted and you may not know what it is, but you, it may prevent you from going on and doing, whether it's exercise or whether it's doing a particular role like you talked about, um, you know, your, your, your family, for example. So do you think in, in terms of what we've got here, you know, if you think about general health and wellness in general, do, do you feel that if you, if you want to be healthy and eat well and, and, and exercise and, and sleep well, which is part of a healthy life, that it, it, it could be really important to, to say, well, look, you know, have, have your brain scanned just make sure that everything is correct and in order. If not, you know, maybe there's a little bit of optimization needed and then build that into, you know, your gym and your nutrition list and everything else. Do you feel that those are all kind of interconnected now? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really a critical piece and um, this is really, I think, your area of expertise and this has been an area where I think we've been learning and if we talk about sort of these three pillars of, um, you know, physical training and, and being smart about it, uh, diet and nutrition being another pillar, and then recovery as being the third. Um, our technology and our approach, I think, is squarely in this recovery space, particularly if we're able to impart higher quality, more restorative sleep. And that has so many downrange benefits. And just to touch a little bit on it, we've talked about some of the um, discipline and focus required to uh, maintain healthy habits and uh, keeping the diligence to, um, you know, go into the gym and, and do your workouts, but also to make smart food choices. And I just think about one of these areas of sleep that's really interesting is there ends up being a bit of a cascade that happens when you have consecutive nights of poor quality sleep and you're underslept. Uh, there are two hunger hormones, ghrelin and leptin, that can become a bit imbalanced. And ghrelin is our hunger hormone, leptin is the one that makes us feel satiated and full. And even with just a few nights of poor sleep, uh, we can't see increases um, in the amount of ghrelin and it makes it hard for people to make those smart food choices. And so uh, that ends up being its own kind of um, self-fulfilling prophecy. And if we can, break that chain by getting people higher quality sleep. Um, a lot of it, I think, takes care of itself. Nobody sets out the day thinking, I want to fail at this, right? It's, it's mostly about uh, having good habits and uh, you know, having those fundamental building blocks that will allow them to succeed. And um, I think that's part of the discussion that we're involved in is uh, how do we set people up for the best possible um, success and uh, sleeping sort of foundational to all of this. Mm. And and do you do, and, and this is the there's there's probably a couple of sides of looking at. It. Do do you find that if let let's come up with a scenario. Let's say somebody has. You, you, we talked earlier about um, soccer, as they call it in America, or football, mm -hmm. as we do in England. And 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 you know you're tracking people that are you know kids are playing football and and potentially disrupting things by you know heading the ball. Um, over a period. So, so say for example, somebody does that a lot as a kid and that they 
and, and that there's been some kind of slight trauma as a result of that. Could that in itself affect your quality of sleep later life because of, of some sort of trauma caused by that then? Yeah, uh, unfortunately that is something that we see quite often is uh, if we see disruptions in brain activity early in the developmental cycle, uh, that can have uh, kind of longer range impact, so to speak. Now there's pluses and minuses as uh, if this happens earlier in life, there's a lot more neuroplasticity and uh, we see a lot of those people recover quite nicely. Um, but if um, we see people who are a little bit older who may have sustained injuries, um, that can manifest in a number of different ways. One of the issues related to uh, not just traumatic brain injury, but uh, persistent post-concussion symptoms, um, it's multifactorial, but we see both uh, sleep disruption, but neuroendocrine disruption as well. What does that mean? So neuroendocrine disruption refers to changes in hormone balance. And mm. so uh, a lot of that cascade, what we call the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, um, starts in the brain. And if there is some type of injury that may impact that axis, um, you know, we can see uh, shifts in testosterone and some of the other uh, kind of hormones that are fundamental to our biology and our existence. Uh, there's some beautiful studies that were done with the military um, where the number of deployments people do was becoming associated with deficiencies in uh, testosterone level. And so there's now, I think only now becoming a uh, real recognition of that. And I think if we're talking about the causal mechanisms, um, there's still some learning to do. Is it a result of chronic sleep deprivation? Is it injury sustained overseas? Um, we think about uh, some of the environment that these operators are exposed to. Uh, they're staying up late at night because they have night vision goggles, they have a tactical advantage, they're trying to sleep during the day. It's almost a perfect prescription for a sleep deprivation type scenario. Um, and certainly we see, see that in our population as well. Many people who uh, have not been in a highly kinetic environment or a combat environment, uh, but are just chronically underslept. Uh, we see patterns that look like brain injury. Mm. And so, uh, you know, the brain, you know, our biology doesn't necessarily care what the mechanism of injury is. It responds to these injuries in similar ways. And one of those ways is to slow down. And uh, that's part of, I think, the science that's evolving. We're starting to learn a bit more about how the different mechanisms may um, yield changes in neuronal activity and brain function. How would you know about that then? Because it, it sounds like that I could be a person going to my doctor or a gym and, uh, or, or my trainer or thera physiotherapist or whatever, and, and it's like, okay, look, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this or with that. And like, unless you, without doing a brain scan then, would it be difficult to identify because i suppose you're looking at the effects of things that you may put down to what well, there could be a number of different reasons that you could put it down to if you had low testosterone or if you had trouble keeping weight off or if you had trouble with performance there could be so many if you're looking at causes there could be so many um potential options but i, I suppose pr without a brain scan, it, would it be quite difficult then to, to truly pinpoint exactly what may be causing that, would you, would, would you say? It can be difficult. Historically, um, this has been sort of, um, you know, asking the right questions, there being awareness and education around um, the types of factors that can lead to um, deterioration of function, whether it's uh, concussions and head injuries, um, chronic sleep deprivation, you know, many people can get involved in motor vehicle accidents. Uh, there's sometimes difficult conversations to have, uh, but I think more and more, um, as awareness increases, we can have those conversations. We think the brain imaging is an important part of that discussion. And the more we can get these at specified intervals, we may be able to capture a bit more, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's uh, preseason for an athletic team, somebody sustains an injury, we'd be able to see very clearly what that injury looks like. Um, it can be in uh, military units. Uh, we're talking a lot to um, you know, firefighters and police officers, law enforcement about getting 
uh, EEG so that we can make informed decisions uh, in the future. But even for uh, physical trainers and physiotherapists, um, I think it's interesting to see um, if we start to measure what these changes are with um, things that we implement, whether it's a new exercise regimen, uh, some new movements, uh, incorporating cryotherapy or uh, red light therapy, some of these other modalities involved in recovery, uh, seeing how they might impact brain function with a simple 15 minute study uh, seems to make a lot of sense. And so I think in the future, we're going to start seeing more incorporation of this kind of technology into um, this realm of, uh, of fitness, particularly as it relates to the brain-body connection. Mm -hmm.